friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so excited that you're here. Each week, I invite a girlfriend to join me on the show, and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. I want to thank one of the partners for today's show, and that is author Stephanie Mae Wilson. Stephanie Mae Wilson has a friendship small group guide, The Real Girl's Guide to Taking It All Off. Finding time to spend with girlfriends is hard, and even when we can, many of us don't have a group of best friends, and there's no blueprint for how to form one until now. After moving to a new city, Stephanie was struggling with this herself when she had an idea. She wrote out a list of questions that would help the group get to know each other and invited new friends over for a girls' night. That night, they laughed, they cried, and they spoke God's truths into tender areas of each other's lives. And before they knew it, strangers became friends, and friends became best friends. Those questions became the six-week small group guide that has achieved the same friendships and communities all over the country. Whether you're looking to connect with old friends, to go deeper with new friends, or for the next study group for your small group, our lives are so much richer when we have best friends to share them with, and this guide is the perfect way to get there. Right now, Happy Hour listeners can download the first chapter for free. Go to stephaniemaywilson.com slash happy hour to get your copy today. Guys, you are listening to episode number 124, and today my guest is Ann Vogel. Ann is also a podcaster like myself, and if you've never listened to her show, What Should I Read Next? I highly recommend it. She's also the creator and blogger behind the blog, Modern Mrs. Darcy. On the show today, we chatted about podcasting, obviously, since we both enjoy that, and we spent a lot of time talking about books and writing. I love hearing your thoughts about the show while you're listening, so if you want to send us a message about anything from the show, we'd love to hear from you. I'm at Jamie underscore Ivy on Twitter, and Anne is at Ann Bogle. If you haven't subscribed to the show, I would love it if you did that today. It's super easy. Go to jamieivy.com slash iTunes. Then you can subscribe, or you can just search The Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy in whatever podcast app you use to listen to shows. The best thing about being subscribed to podcasts is that every single time new shows are released, you automatically get it downloaded into your device. I also want to let you guys know that at the end of this episode, I'm going to be telling you the dates and the guest for the next Happy Hour Live event. So stick around because I'm super excited about what's coming up. Guys, here is my conversation with Anne. Hey, Anne, welcome to the Happy Hour. Thank you for having me. It is so fun to interview a podcaster because I think that you like being interviewed because it's fun when you're on the other side of the microphone, isn't it? All the fun and none of the responsibility. It's that, great. That's how I feel when I do shows of other people's. I'm like, I just show up to the table and they're in charge of making it work. So and talk about all your favorite things. It's yes. great. So you just relax and let me run this show today. <laughs> oh, I'll Rub it in. Yes, yes, yes. Well, welcome to the happy hour. I have been wanting to have you on the happy hour for a while. And so it just worked out. And welcome to 2017 because we're here and we made it. Um, so you are a wife to Will, you have four kids and y'all live in Kentucky. Um, but your job entails a lot of kind of the same things that I do. And I think we have the coolest jobs in the world. Um, so tell everybody what you do, not in your mom wife life, but what is your job? It is the coolest job in the world, right? right? Yes. Although it's very difficult to explain at like parent coffee hour. (laughs) Or what do you write on when, you know, when you're filling out paperwork and it's like, job just like what's the what is the question i'm even trying to think of it just says like what is your job what do you put (laughs) well it depends on the context and what kind of form it is okay so so it's for your kid's school uh probably writer okay but at the doctor's office it's usually uh owner which sounds so lame oh i never even thought about that yeah occasionally the checkbox is manager which sounds extra lame but, but like writer is the general default thing, which people don't know what to do with, but that's okay. That's okay. I guess I haven't even like owned myself as a writer yet because I mean, I do write all the time and I have published stuff, but I haven't like, I always put down podcaster. <laughs> you know, people was, are like, was, what the heck is that? I was just thinking at least writer is probably better than podcaster. <laughs> totally better. I'm, I'm switching as as today. The, uh, I'm never writing like podcaster again. Killer. Or sometimes I put media. You know, like that oh. that's so vague though. It could be anything, but I don't care. I like that. That's interesting. Okay. So Louisville is an Austin wannabe and gets compared a lot from Louisville people compared uh-huh. to Austin. Probably not the other way around, I'm thinking. Well, maybe uh, not, but 
but it's a similar kind of community, like lots of local independent kind of stuff, lots mm-hmm. of public radio. And I have a lot of friends who work in that field who do pretty much the same thing I do. Yeah. Just it's different things. So I could just say media exactly. and be nice and vague, but still professional sound, sounding. Still, still professional. Okay. Well, tell everyone, everyone what you actually do. Like, um, let's see. <laughs> we I mean, about writer, media, talking. podcaster, but tell us where they can find you. So I run the little hub of the internet that spokes out of modern Mrs. Darcy, which my favorite description is not my own, but it is a lifestyle blog for nerds. So <laughs> lots of books and reading, lots of um, Emily Dickinson is my personal tagline that's not on the blog. Mm-hmm. I, dwell in, I dwell in possibility. Let's find other ways of looking at familiar things in, in from an angle you haven't considered before. So from modern Mrs. Darcy, I have the podcast, What Should I Read Next? That my people want to have you on. We're making a plan. Oh, okay, and, okay. Um, the Modern Mrs. Darcy Book Club, which is a member site where we read a book a month and have a lot of author chats and have some courses on, like this month, it's bullet journaling for book nerds and getting more out of your reading life in 2017. And I'm now writing books. So all that stuff is in my little center of the universe. I the, love all that you're doing. Universe. All Me the too. Modern Mrs. Darcy universe. And I mean, you, if you said media, you could sum up a lot of that. So you could just put that in your back pocket for next time you're filling out those forms. All right. I, I'm ready. Um, okay, so you have a podcast and I love talking to podcasters because I'm always a really big fan of people podcasting. I feel like it's kind of a similar way how blogging started, you know, years ago um, and everyone kind of jumped in and they had this new outlet that hadn't been there before. And I felt like podcasting was that for me two 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 and a half years ago when I started and people come to me often and they're like, I want to start a podcast, but I really don't know if I should because everyone is. And I'm like, no, everyone's not. Yes, you should. Like, I'm just a cheerleader <laughs> of people starting things because I think this is such a fun medium uh, to create content and to talk to people. So what made you want to add on to what you're already doing a podcast? Well, I thought about doing it for a long time, mostly because I love podcasts and have been listening to them for a long time. I remember when uh, Will and I were given an iPod back in like 2002 oh, yeah, and I right? thought, what <laughs> on earth would anyone do with this? Mm-hmm. So pretty soon, like we figured it out. So, so I've always loved podcasts and I thought, oh, wouldn't that be fun to do? But I just didn't have, I don't know, like turning the blog into a podcast to talk about more of the same in a different medium mm-hmm. never made sense to me. So, but then I finally realized this this blog series that I didn't love called, um, I think I called it literary matchmaking, where I invited readers to tell me three books they love, one book they hate and what they're reading now. And I would make recommendations for what they should read next. I finally realized that what was so unsatisfying about having that on the blog medium, which is there's no conversation, like yeah. you can't talk, would make an excellent podcast. So once I realized like, oh, hey, I have this idea that perfectly fits this certain medium, all of a sudden, instead of like, oh, why would I want to add to what I'm already doing? I got really excited about it. And since then, um, I've learned that podcasting is a lot more fun and a lot more involved than I ever dreamed. Yes, would yes, 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 yes. Um, podcasting is so much fun to me. But for me, what held me back starting, I don't know if you felt this at all, was, you know, I was kind of like you where I kind of had this idea and I'm like, this would be amazing. This would be fun. And I had a little bit of really just small, small stint of experience in like radio world. But for me, what held me back so much was the technology of, I was just like, I couldn't wrap my brain around how to even create a podcast. So that took me a while to even get up the guts to kind of even watch YouTube videos about it. Did did that scare you at all? Well, I did it the lazy way. So I've learned a lot from blogging, (laughs) which is you can figure anything out. And sometimes figuring it out with air quotes means like getting somebody who always knows or who already knows what they're doing yes. to do it for you. Yes. So I knew people who were um, podcasters and it was really important to me because I do have a lot of uh, plates in the air already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think the metaphor is usually balls. Plate sounds dangerous, it, but, I think you can but say it feels either, a little yeah. dangerous adding new stuff to your plates. Mm-hmm. Wow. So but when many plates metaphors. fall, they make it's a be, it's a bigger crash than balls. So, you know, you can go with that. When I was really afraid of the crash. So I love the idea of producing the content for the podcast, but I really didn't feel I had the margin to take on any of that technical stuff. So I found someone who did and said, okay, if you can handle the technical stuff, so I don't have to spend all this time learning how to upload a podcast to iTunes, Mm -hmm. you know, to get started, which I will do exactly once in my life and will never do again. Um, you know, like that learning curve just yes. doesn't pay off, uh-huh. then I can move ahead with it. So once that was in place, I could focus on the fun stuff. That's good. And I it's, think, go ahead. Oh, well, 
there's a lot more technical stuff that I have had to learn. But and now I can do almost everything. So that doesn't that didn't work out quite like I expected. Well, I but think still, it's good most, that you know how to do it though. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I think, you know, whenever we're learning something new, the scary thing about it, once you actually figure out a little bit how to handle it, it's not as scary anymore, you know. And I think that goes for lots of people who are starting new things, you know, in 2017, so many people are going to have new ideas and new things and there's scary parts about it. But sometimes when you jump into those scary things, you find out it's not as scary as I thought it was. That's how I felt that, about the technical stuff. That is very true. And I think it's also good as podcasters to have an appreciation of what goes into the process, right. whether people are doing it for, you know, actually for our own shows, you know, the happy hour and what should I read next, or whether they're doing it for the shows that we enjoy listening to and the level of production for like my show. And um, like the Gimlet shows I oh enjoy. Oh my gosh, let's just be honest. Totally different world. Yes. But still, it's, it's good to have an appreciation of what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, and I wish, but those shows like that Gimlet puts out, I mean, I love all, a lot of their shows and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, they have like a team of people and money and an office and a company and they put out good, good stuff. I would love to have a little more added stuff into my show, but... It's we're running like a three man ship around here. You know, I mean, it's just all we can do. I think there wouldn't be a show if that was the bar I was aiming for. <laughs> right. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. you knew where your level was and you knew what you could do uh, exactly. for sure. For sure. Um, I know I edited my show. I did everything, everything for the first year and a half. Um, and I think for me, that was good because I did have the margin to learn that and to do that because I wasn't um, full time putting out content all the time like you do. Uh, with your writing and so for me i had the margin to learn and it was good for me to appreciate it and there's been a handful of times where i've had to step in and edit the show i mean oh my gosh but i got done so there it is i salute you for that year and a half oh i know that year and a half um how long has your show been on uh we are right at a year right congratulations thank you very much that feels good doesn't it it feels a little crazy i know i know i know um, well, congratulations on your show. Uh, what should I read next? Um, I think anyone who loves reading uh, will love the show. Um, I'm always getting great ideas and great. You don't. You kind of have a big, wide range as well because you give ideas for kids and for all kinds of things. And so it's a great, to use your word, nerdville <laughs> podcast. Although I love, I'm. I always say readers are leaders, and so there you go. Everyone should be listening to get new book ideas. I want a button that says that. Readers are leaders. I love it so yeah. much. But, you know, I found out, and I've said this on the show before, so people are kind of rolling their eyes at me. But I found out, I always say the quote is readers are leaders, but that's not exactly how it went. Do you know how it went? No. The quote, and it was said by a president's wife. Again, I, I'm the worst with, like, quoting people because I always are, I'm always like, well, I knew this one person that said this, but it was a president's wife, and she said, um, here, let me let me get it right. I have to think every time. She said this, um, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. Well, and nice guys finish seventh, but what sounds better? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Well, I would put, but I get a bumper sticker for one and a pin for the other and put both on my apparel and vehicles and then we could satisfy everybody. There you go, there you go. Readers are leaders. I love reading. Okay, speaking of reading, it's the beginning of 2017 and I don't know, there's probably people listening that did this. I did this about... Probably five years ago, my New Year's resolution, which I'm not really big on New Year's resolutions, but I made a resolution to read more. Okay, so my goal was to read 12 books in a year. And for someone who hadn't been reading, and that's a lot of stinking books, you know, um, you probably that's, read. That's a great goal. That's a great goal. It was like one book a month. I could handle that, right? And I made it. And that kind of set this in me of like, I want to keep reading. I want to keep reading. Um, and so I have had years where I've read, you know, in the 30s. And this year, I mean, 2016, I did not hit that. Because here's the deal. When I am producing content, it is hard for me to read. Do you feel that way, even though it's your job? It has never affected me until this year. Because when I was writing. Yeah, I was writing. And it was, I mean, it killed my reading life. That's how I feel because it's like I don't want to read stuff that people write like me because then I get I think they're amazing and I should just throw the towel in. Um, and I just if I'm reading, which reading is an outlet, but I always feel like I should be doing something else because I have a book due. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah. And you know what happened about the same time? Because I went into a major period of 
edits right when my kids went back to school, which I thought was brilliant timing. And it was in many ways, but also during the summer, like two to 4 PM, I'm reading every day. Like it's just a built in rhythm to the day. Uh And I pick my kids up at like, I get in the car at three o'clock. So I would work right up till three o'clock. And while I often listen to audiobooks or podcasts in the car, it that's not the same as mm. two hours on the couch. And we just do it like that was our kind of like, I work from home and the babysitter during the summer would usually leave at 1.30 or two. So that was just our low key time of day where I would like deliberately read either with my kids or in front of my kids or we go to the pool and I read at the pool because mm-hmm. my, my youngest is six now and, and I can do that. I know, me too. Me too. Yeah. So having that happen, and it took me a while to figure out what was happening. Like, I'm not getting through books like I did. And that was okay. Like, if that had happened in March, what I'm doing every year, I put out a big summer reading guide and I read all the books in it, which means I have to read a lot more books than that because sometimes the books you think are going to sound amazing are yeah. not amazing. And sometimes the books that look kind of heh heh um, rock your world. So I got to figure out which is which. And in March, I'll be reading a ton. But in September, I could kind of let it go a little bit, but I miss it when that happens. Oh, I bet. When is this big reading guide you put out? It's every May. It's a couple of weeks before Memorial Day. Okay, so but it's I like just your want summer reading. Everyone get your books for summer reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every year. Yeah. And it's not usually, I mean, summer reading season is big, a big season uh, publishing wise, like a ton of books come out between May and September, and then it starts backing off. So they're not necessarily like books you could only read. You gotcha. know, in your mm-hmm. bathing suit with your sunglasses right. on. On the beach. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's just the cycle. I it it's a lot of fun. It works for me and my readers. And that's why it's summer reading. But I do want to back up and say the 12 books is a great goal. And I am not at all into quantity. Like the only reason it matters for me is vetting these books for the stuff I do on the blog and the podcast. But otherwise, like 12 is a lot more than most Americans read. Yes, it it's is. Very attainable. But it forces you to like consciously approach your reading life and think like, okay, like what am I going to choose? So I like it. Don't apologize for having a goal like that. Yeah. And I've heard you say this before, and I'll tell you that I struggle with this. You have said that you do not finish a book you don't like. (laughs) Is that (laughs) true? No, I don't. That's absolutely true. Where's the line for you? Because for me, um, I feel an obligation. This is so dumb. It's so dumb. I feel an obligation to the work that the author put in that if I've started it, I need to finish it on behalf of them. Is that so dumb? Well, who's the author? That depends. I mean, you know, if your mom wrote the book, like I would finish the book. I would probably finish the book if it was your mom and not just mine, Jane. <laughs> well, thank you. My mom thinks you as well. Um, but the fact that a book got published, I don't, and the more I found out about publishing, the the easier it is for me to give up books. Okay, so like, maybe uh, it's like if I know the person, I definitely want to finish it. Well, maybe. 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 But also, I find myself in my job when I have a lot of people on the show who have written books is I'll read their book. And it's not that I don't like it at all. It's that I just can't physically finish every book that I start of someone on the show. Does that right, make sense? Right, right. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. But what's your, what's your t- like you get in, how many, how long do you give it before you're like, I'm done with this book? Um, I abandoned a book at 80% last week where, <gasps> oh my gosh, you yeah. got that far. Mm-hmm, I did. It just hurt. It hurt. But there was um, nothing in you that said, I, I really need to know how this ends. Well, there was a little, but that's what kept me going from 50% to okay, 80%. Yeah. I was like, you made it pretty far. So I was working through was obviously like the low point of someone's life. This was a memoir and it sounded so promising and it's so timely. That's my favorite and I time. really wanted I love memoirs. Well, I don't think you'd love this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not, but um, you can tell me off air because I even feel weird like talking about someone, some, a book and saying that I don't like it. Isn't that awful? Oh, I, I haven't told you the title. I know. <laughs> I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, I, I got the impression from early on that uh, there, and there, I've read a lot of memoirs like that this fall and I've abandoned a lot of memoirs like that this fall where the story is really good, but the tone sounds very self-indulgent and I am fine with um, like self-reflective and I don't think that's narcissistic at all when done well, but sometimes it sounds, it just, it just wasn't working for me. Okay. I don't think it was just me. But do a lot of people love this book? Um, The ratings were really good. Okay. Okay. Which is one of the reasons like I do what I do. And there's a podcast because you can't always choose based on the ratings. But and then sometimes I'll abandon a book after five pages. And usually it's more. Usually I give it uh, like 20 percent. Okay, And then that's a good way to know. Yeah. Does this make you nervous as an author? I mean, it's like to think 
that people are going to like get your book in your hands and be like, I don't even want to finish it. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And the things I've heard while working on my manuscript are so interesting. Like um, a lot of people don't read introductions, period, the end. Oh. And I was like, are you kidding me? So and I started you? asking, do I read introductions? Yeah. Uh, every time. I love the I love introductions and acknowledgments where the author like talks to you about the why yeah. and the how, what they hope you're going to get out of the book. I love that. But I started talking to a bunch of my author, no, not author friends, reading friends. Yeah. And I said, would you believe this? And like half of them said, oh, I never read the introduction. And I was flabbergasted because I just don't know how other people, like, you know how you read. It's not, yeah. reading isn't something you watch other people do. Mm-hmm once you reach a certain age. And I just had no idea. You know, you said acknowledgements. I read every single acknowledgement. I love acknowledgements. I do too, because I I love to see, yes, where they, who are they? I want to know who they're thinking and how they thank them. That tells me a lot about the author. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where's their heart? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also interesting to see um, who's working with who and -hmm. who knows each other. And because sometimes I'll see another favorite author that I would think had no connection to the author of the book I'm reading say like, oh, and thanks for meeting me at Starbucks every Thursday night. Like what (laughs) would I have done without you? So, you know, like it feels like a small world kind of moment. Do you read endorsements? Um, You know, not really. I mean, you can't miss it if it's on the front of the book. Right. But I mean, the first two pages or whatever. Mm, No. Yeah. I'm so... I'm jaded. Like, I know that so many times that those are. Because um, you're in this see. world, the publishing world. Yeah. No, this makes me sound cynical. So maybe we should cut this. But um, but like, I know so many times that the person hasn't even read the book. So, oh, you know, I. I don't read either, so I don't need to read the opinion of somebody else who hasn't read the book. Right. I am like, if I put my name on a book, I've read it because um, I heard someone one time saying they had a really bad experience where they didn't read the full book and they endorsed it and then they wished that they wouldn't. And um, I remember hearing that and thinking, oh, yeah, that's like for real. You know, like you if you want to know what someone's writing, um, especially for books that are probably um, nonfiction, if that makes sense. Oh, that's so funny. I was just thinking in my head that you're probably reading more nonfiction because of the friends you have writing books. But with fiction, I was thinking that's probably more true. I can see it both ways. Yeah. Because with fiction, you can have a great story until the last page and then change your mind about everything. Oh, I need to read more fiction. Fiction has gone away from me and I'm super sad about it because of my job. I read so much nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably when I tell you some of the books I read this year, Literally, the two that I picked that are, um, no, three that I picked that are um, nonfiction might be, I only read maybe five nonfiction books all year. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and whenever not crazy. It yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because my job. But whenever I say um, nonfiction and fiction, every time I have to pause in my head and think not, no, I have to think fake and not fake. <laughs> every time. <laughs> every time I have to pause. Just now I had to pause to figure out what I was trying to say. So I always have to think about it. Won the hearts of novel writers everywhere. (laughs) Yes, right? I am your reader. There I am. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Now, as you, when you write for, I mean, when you are talking about books all the time and you said people read differently, how do you, how do you like not justify, but how do you balance the, you're putting your opinion out there, you know, and I might feel differently about a book than you do. Do you feel, where do you find that tension of, when you're writing about these books or you're recommending these books, um, do you find that you're recommending the same type of books because it's what you like? Or do you try to find a, a wide variety for pe- for your readers? I try to do both. So I found over the years that you have to own what you like and communicate that to other people. Because That's good. Because then you're just, oh, yes, yes. Good, good, good. Okay, I get it. Go ahead. Well, like no book recommendations exist in a vacuum. They just, you know, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm clear on what I like, but I also try to um, give, like sometimes there are many ways to enjoy a book or not enjoy a book. So sometimes I can read a book and say, you know, this was really well done and I can see that it was well written and the subject was handled with, you know, grace and eloquence. And this could be fiction or non, it doesn't matter, but it just didn't do it for me. Like, I know I don't like the quiet contemplative stuff, or I know I don't like the, I don't know, fast paced thriller, legal, Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. I actually like both those things a lot, but let's just say, um, but I can see that it was well written and the easiest way to talk about a book like that is to be like, okay, if you loved the Pelican Brief, you will love, the odds of you loving right. this book are really high. Right. I don't want to make it sound like 100% guarantee, but a lot of times you can play the, well, if you like this book, try this one next. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
people use the word read alike, which I'm not a big fan of because you already read the book. You don't want to read another one just mm. like it properly. Right. Um, but that is an easy way to talk about it. Like authors do, um, a lot of them are similar to each other, not in a bad way, but just like, I don't know, if you like pot roast, you'll probably like beef stew. Like, right. I get it. You know, yeah. Same yeah. thing. I wouldn't it, recommend you eat sushi next without knowing anything else about your exactly, taste. Exactly. You know, and it's so funny. I get in kind of a um, stuck in a certain type of book a lot. But last year, not 2016, but the year before, someone recommended a book to me that literally I told them, I will hate this book. I do not like books like this. Um, and it was The Martian. Yeah. And I loved it. Loved it. Did you read it and love it or you hated it? I'm nervous. I did read it. I you really enjoyed it. it. Oh, good. Okay. And you know what? I think you're not alone because that's the kind of book that I think is a lot of fun because it's the kind of book where a lot of people said, I don't care about Mars. I don't care exactly. about space. I don't care about sci-fi, but I love this book. That's how I felt. Yes, Yeah. exactly. And then I saw the movie and the movie was great. You know what helped me a lot as well? And this is kind of funny. And I don't know if you do this or anyone listening does this is if a book comes out, I really love reading a book if I know a movie's coming out because I just, I like the thought of reading the book before the movie. But if the book's coming out or it's already been out for a while and so then there's this movie releasing and I see the trailer and so then I see the actors that are playing the movie as I'm reading the book I see them in my head and that's how it was for me with The Martian I so read that the was a good thing. yes it was great for me because the whole time I read it I saw Matt Damon and like I heard his voice and it was like I could picture him doing the book if that makes sense yeah, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I saw the trailers and he seemed believable to me. And I kept hearing how good it was. Oh, One it was day great. I'm going to yeah. see it. But yeah. I haven't... yeah, it was great. But, you know, it was the flip side for me. Do you remember those um, vampire books? I mean, everyone read them probably five or six years ago with the werewolves, the vampires. Is it the, is it the Twilight books? The Twilight books, yes. So I read those um, and then the movie came out and the characters were not believable to me. And so there's an example of how it didn't work well for me. I'm but. sorry to hear that. I haven't seen the book. No, I haven't read the book or seen the movie. That's not your so. thing, is it? No, like so much so. Oh, wait, I know when they came out because I have, uh, my son is turning seven this month, my youngest son. And you uh, when newborn. we, well, not quite. I had a, I had a child in utero. And here's wow. how I know about Twilight because <laughs> I was talking to a friend and we were talking about baby names and she was a good friend because otherwise I wouldn't have been telling her potential baby names. Because I don't want everybody's opinion about my uh -huh, baby names. Right. And um, so I told her the names and she was like, those are lovely names. They fit with your other kids. They suit your family. They sound good with your last name. But I know you would want to know those are Twilight names. <gasps> really? So when you make your decision, like that should be a factor. And I was like, how would I have known that? This is why you run your names by your friends. That Justin. is a good friend. Yes. I, we have some friends right now that will not tell anyone their baby name until the baby is born. And they are... They could have the same tragedy upon their hands. They could. There could be some teen sensation that they have no <laughs> clue about. And their child will grow up. With like, oh, did your name come from Twilight or whatever? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. One Dangerous of our, business. Yes. One of our kids, I wanted to name Theo because I, I just love the name Theo. You don't hear it very often. But what's the first thing you think of when you hear the name Theo? Chipmunks. Oh, that's not ours. Ours what was the it? Huxtables. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. So anyhow, Aaron was like, we cannot name our kid Theo because everyone's going to think of the Huxables or the Chipmunks now from Anne. So that's a good thing as well. Um, so you have a good friend that told you that. Um, I do. Okay. So we did not go to the right name. What were the, do you remember the names? One was Edward and I forget the girl name. Oh, Edward was the vampire. So yep. good friend. Yep. Um, okay. Speaking of things that we've read in 2016, I said, I told you earlier that I wanted to know um, some of the books that you really enjoyed in 2016. Um not necessarily your favorite book of the year, because can you actually even define your favorite book of the year? That makes me sweat. Well, I can say my favorite book of the year right now that is top of mind. And you do I, know? Uh, okay. No, no, no. Sorry. I'm saying that favorites are shifting things. Oh, like okay, today yes. I can have a favorite. Today, but tomorrow, I got it. I, have a one. I got it. So what were some of the favorite books that you read in 2016? Okay. Well, you asked me for three, so I brought it. I know, but I brought, I wrote down like seven. So you can tell me more because I, I have a hard time with this, but go ahead. Mine are all novels. Is that funny? That's hilarious. And I love it because I'm going to need to read these. Okay. So book one, these are in the order I read them because okay. that'll be easier. Okay. Book one is The One in a Million Boy by Monica Wood. And to all your listeners who are like, oh, I want to Google that book right now. Uh, this book, I was in a bookstore in St. Louis. It's called The Novel Neighbor. Uh, my friend Holland Saltzman owns it. And I said, okay, I'm looking for summer reading guide. 
picks, what is good? What have you read and loved lately? Because sometimes we commiserate about how there seems to be nothing good coming out. And sometimes we commiserate about how like all the good books are like flooding us. So she pressed this book into my hands and said, don't read the jacket. Don't read, you know, don't flip to page 69. Like I know you like to do just take it back and start reading it. And it's a good thing. She told me that because I would have read the flap copy and been like, Oh, I don't read books like this, but I loved it. So what, what, when you say books like this, can you tell us or is it going to ruin nope. it for us? You can't nope. tell me. Can't tell you. Can't okay, tell I'm you. looking at it and I really like the cover. I'm into covers these days. So I really like the cover. So I give it a thumbs up on the cover. I don't know if the cover would have captured me. And the author said that her title for it, like the publisher put the one in a million boy on it. And she said that was fine. But her title for it was The Awakening World. And here's what I can tell you about it, minus the plot. Um, because of something that happens, a group of unlikely friendships form between people who wouldn't have connected okay. otherwise. Okay. And I love stories like that, that yeah. bring people together for unusual reasons who normally wouldn't, you know, we tend to like, like tends to gravitate towards like, and I think our world can be so much poorer for that. So in these pages, I loved seeing these people come together who shouldn't have been friends, but were the perfect friends for each other. It was such a good book. Oh, isn't that just like life? Like that's a perfect story. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And then after that nonfiction, I wanted to read more by Monica Wood. So I read her memoir, When We Were the Kennedys, which was also quite good mm. about growing up in Maine. Okay, my second book, you want to take turns or you want to? No, you just go. This makes me nervous because this is <laughs> so good. And okay, keep going. Okay. My second book is Everyone Brave is Forgiven by Chris Cleave. It's a World War II historical novel. And my husband actually read this before me because I get a lot of... Um, there's a lot of books at my house that mm -hmm. come in the mail and they stack yeah. up. Will always digs through the stack. So this is a war novel. So of course he grabs it off the stack and starts reading. And we're reading in bed at night and he's like, listen to this, listen to this. Wait, hold, listen to this one. And he kept reading me quotes. And um, the quotes were so like funny and snappy and witty and it was wonderful dialogue and just really wry observations. Um, this is the story of four friends in London and then two of them go off to war. Or let me think, one of them goes off to war. Um, during the Blitz in World War II. And it is just, I don't want to say too much about it. I don't want to get all gushy because then if I was in your shoes, I roll my eyes and yeah, yeah, whatever. Right, right. She, she's kind of lost her head. But it's a really well done, um, very well written, very engaging. There's a sequel coming out. I can't wait to read, but I'm going to have to wait for like three years. And um, it's just so good. And then our summer reading book club. Okay, wait, can I tell you something about this book? Yeah, 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 please. Okay, um, he wrote Little Bee. Yeah, he did. Which is one of my favorite books ever. I haven't read it because I've been scared of it. <gasps> but our summer, because it's intense, right? Yes, I mean, I keep but it is so really good. Intense. I keep hearing that too, which is why I'm going to read it. But our summer book club talked to the author, Chris Cleave, about the book. And he was amazing. Like not just added to our understanding of the book, but you know there's experience where you meet a person or you meet an author and you're like, um, you're charming and your work is amazing. And I want to read everything you've ever written. Oh, that was my that experience. That was Chris Cleave. Yeah. So I haven't read it yet because September and October, all of fall, all of fall has been a little rough. And um, like this time of year, I've been prioritizing new releases over backlist, which yes. is the way it is. Um, but yeah, now I can't wait to read it. Give in little a, a chance. Way. Yes. And just kind of tuck yourself away and like fall into it and you'll be happy that you read it. In the end. In the end, you will. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Third. I'm glad to hear uh, the Course of Love by Alain de Baton. Um, what to say about this one? This is one you either will love or will hate. So he is a contemporary philosopher. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he's telling the very real story of an ordinary marriage. Um, two people who meet at work, fall in love, have babies, things get bumpy. You know, they fight over the curtains and the laundry and who makes dinner. Um, and... He intersperses this very ordinary couple. I mean, mm -hmm. they have like a big fight over what mug to buy at Ikea. You know, like right. real life here. Life, yeah. And, yeah, the kind of thing you're like, who would write a novel about that? Mm -hmm. Like, I can talk to my neighbor about her life and it'll be... <laughs> right. But he intersperses it with these like philosophical musings about what they did right, what they did wrong, how things would have changed if they had just realized where the other person was coming from. And it's this really interesting, it's almost like, here, I can kill the book in everyone's minds right now. It's almost like therapy mm. where he gives, he gives a scene from their lives and then he muses philosophically about it for a little interlude. So 
Either you will love it or hate it. I okay. loved it. I okay. thought it was really interesting and thought provoking. It's small. It's short. It's got a great cover. So it does not, have a great cover. Yeah, I'm looking at it. So not much lost if you give it a try and you're like, eh, this is not for me. The odds are good that your reading friend will like it. But I really liked it. It was so interesting and unusual without being gimmicky. And that's hard to come by. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I love your books. And I'm really, really, like, even if I ever come on your show, I'm nervous to tell you about my book reading because it's so different than yours. I think that's amazing. Okay. Don't be nervous at all. Okay. Because, like, there's been a lot of talk this year and last year in America about the echo chamber. Um, it's like that with reading. Like, mm -hmm. if you only read what you know and what you like, then where's the fun in that? You there never you get go. to branch out. There you like go. branching out. Okay, hit me. Okay, I'm going to, I wrote down six. I'm going to come up with three. Okay, you ready? Um, first, I'm going to tell you about a book that I think everyone in America read except for me because we probably <laughs> read it in school. Okay. But my seventh I school in Kentucky. So, you know, go ahead. <laughs> okay. My seventh <laughs> grader had to read The Outsiders this year. Yeah. So did mine. Yeah. And so um, I never read it. And I thought, I'm going to read it this summer. I bought him the book because he needed it. I'm going to read it before he reads it to, for two reasons. Number one, I was curious about the book. And number two, I'm like, I'll be a good mom and then we can talk about it. Um, I loved that book so much. Have you read it? No, I haven't read it. I meant to because <gasps> my son was reading it, but instead my husband read it. Did for he the first like time. it? He did. He really liked it. And my son really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I really, really liked it. And I think if I am right, I think this author wrote this book when he was like 18 years old. It's a she, and I think she was 16. She. Oh, look, <laughs> thank you for it. Okay. Isn't it's that a she? Crazy? Yeah. How did I miss that? Well, it's an initial. So yeah, how are you going to know? Yeah. And how like sexist of me to assume it's a man. Okay. I really, really, really loved this book. So there's that. Well, it's only like a half inch thick. So I exactly. should go find it. I mean, I read I it like read three it days. Afternoon. Exactly. You could from two to four when you read. Um, okay. So another book that I loved this year uh, was, let me pick out of my six, a book called Space at the Table. Oh, I don't know that. Okay. And um, I... Gosh, I don't remember. I, I'm like you. I get a lot of books. You probably get a lot of fiction books at your house. I get a lot of nonfiction books sent to me. Um, and I was given to this book by someone who works at um, my literary agent's office. And it is a book. And the tagline says, Conversations Between an Evangelical Theologian and His Gay Son. And it was one of the most thoughtful books on this subject that I have read. And so for me, it was like, both sides were talking and they were so kind and they were so full of love that it was just, it was almost like my soul felt good when I read it. If that makes sense. There was no, you're right. You're wrong. It was just, here's how, here's what, where we're coming from. And they loved each other so much. I cried at the end. Like I literally cried because I felt like I had been invited to something very intimate between this dad and his son. It was really, yeah. really, really good. Um, so kind of memoirish because that's my thing. You know, mm -hmm. so there's that space at the table uh, by Brad and Drew Harper. Um, okay. And then a third one. Uh, uh, la, 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 la. <laughs> I've, I've like four more written down. So I'll go with one of the other fiction books that I read. Uh, where'd you go, Bernadette? Yeah. Have you read? I have. Did you like or not? You didn't. I liked it, but I didn't love it. Okay. Well, I, except the, I've, I, heard, I've heard I might have loved it on audio. That the audio was really amazing. Oh, I wonder who read it. Did but that... I read it on paper. I have no idea. Okay. Well, out of the like five fiction books, it was one of my favorites. Um, super quirky. You know, um, just it was, I would call that like a beach read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now that I think about it, the author wrote for Arrested Development. So I could see her work translating. Really... I mean, did you read it on paper? Yes, I read it on paper. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, now since you've just told me how you read all this nonfiction, like you have to tell me one more nonfiction pick. Okay. Or I, another, hope you will. I have three more that I wrote down, but another nonfiction that I wrote is called Wild and Free. I didn't write this uh -huh. that I read. Wild okay. and Free by Jess Conley <laughs> and Haley Morgan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I liked their book a lot. I like those girls a lot. And so that helps me even love a book more if I really love the people that wrote it. Um mm -hmm. and so having known a lot of these people that I read is really, really fun as well. But I also love yeah. She Reads Truth, which to me those books were a lot alike because they're both memoirish saying that they have um stories throughout it um but it's also um you know nonfiction thinking kind of teaching you know faith issues so both of those were two of my favorite books from this year and both of those were written by two authors like two authors wrote oh good point yeah which isn't done a lot no it's not and i think it's really hard like that would be really hard i think but they both yeah. did a great job so yeah. 
And they're all so smart and so sweet. I know. Love all those girls. Um, one thing that I just read on your blog recently was about, you put something up in December about um, gifts for book readers. I yes. loved it because everyone's starting out the new year. And I think that if you're starting out the new year and you're thinking, my goal is to read more, you need to go read Anne's um, gift guide about books and buy yourself a gift to get yourself motivated. That's my advice for everyone listening. So there's that. I love putting together stuff like that because it's just so fun. I don't know what it is about readers where there tends to be this fun overlap with um, papers and pens and pencils and, you know, bookish paraphernalia. But there is, and it's so fun, you know, journals and cards and totally, I love it all. Totally. I'm a, you know what I'm going to buy for myself this year? I have this friend um, that lives here in Austin and um, she bought me a stamp recently and the stamp uh -huh. has my logo on it, the happy hour. Well, I went and looked at the girl's um, Etsy shop that makes this and she makes these stamps that say from the library of and then your name and then you stamp them in all your books. And I thought, I want that so badly because I love the thought of stamping it in my book like this is from my mm -hmm. little library so mm -hmm. i think i'm going to gift myself that in january for all my i books. like the sound of that i know yeah I sounds know. like a good start to your new reading year hey guys before we get back to talking with ann i want to thank another one of our sponsors they partner with us to make these shows happen and that is prep dish you've heard me talk a lot about prep dish on this show it's because i'm a fan of what they're doing i recently received my newest menu from prep dish and here's what alice and the chef gave me the instructions on how to make almond crusted salmon with steamed broccoli and roasted butternut squash maple mustard pork loin with roasted carrots and parsnips and shepherd's pie guys prep dish does what i love and that is that they make cooking simpler they make it easier they make it faster every week when you sign up with prep dish you're going to get an email and it's going to include a menu it's going to include a grocery list and it's going to include steps for you to get everything prepped for the week Right now, they are having a 50% off flash sale for January only. Go to PrepDish.com slash happy hour flash sale, all lowercase. PrepDish is making cooking and spending time with our family so much easier every single day. Again, PrepDish.com slash happy hour flash sale. Okay, I also ask you, since we're both podcasters, what are some of your favorite podcasts that you listened to last year? Ooh, that's not hard. what you expected. Okay. It is hard. Well, see, I go through spurts where I listen to zero podcasts because I'm listening to, like, I just finished the Neapolitan novels on audio. So that took like 60 hours yes. of my reading life. And then I spent six hours listening to a really bad memoir. Where I should have been do you listen to instead. books when you drive or when you walk or what? Um, yes, sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes when it gets crazy, I listen to nothing and leave my phone at home. But, um, yeah, when I when I'm in the car by myself, yeah. which happens a lot more with all my kids in school yeah. than it used to. Yeah, because that has not been the case for us until like the last six months. Okay. They've all been in school. But um, yeah, and then like if I don't like to have my headphones on when my family's around, right? But but if it's just me folding laundry or doing dinner or yep. whatever, mm -hmm. then yeah, I listen then. Yeah. But okay, so there are po are podcasts I love, and none of them are books and reading. So okay, let's I hear love. It. I think you might listen to this one. Go for it. Off camera with Sam Jones. Oh, love it. I love it. I'm not a Hollywood person. I mean, like I, the last movie I saw in the theater was The Hunger Games. I mean, I, <laughs> it's not my yeah. big thing, uh -huh. but he's such a great interviewer. The best, um, he, yes. Yeah, he just interviews creative types. So this week I heard him talk to Kate Beckinsale mm. about, they spent a lot of time talking about Jane Austen and um, just such smart conversations happen. Really interesting. And it's off my beaten path a little bit, which is great for um i like to make connections between things that don't seem to have any relationship to each other on yeah, the surface yeah. and it's just such good um wow this is so cliche but it's such good food for thought just to hear from a different kind of environment i love I really it so like much that. jamie golden um a mutual friend of ours from the podcast told me about that show and she told me she said start with matt damon um and i did i love love that one loved mm -hmm. it so much and so i find myself and my husband Aaron and I he also loves the show as well we were talking about the other day I find myself doing something that I I think people probably do with my show that I that I don't want them to do is that they will listen to the people that they know does that make sense um, mm -hmm. I find myself doing that with Sam Jones uh, which I hate I shouldn't do that because they all have good stuff but did you listen to the Rob Lowe one current recently oh I finished that like yesterday wasn't it good 
It was so good. Was and so here's good. what I really like about his show. Um, it humanizes people that yes. we only know from the screen. And I didn't realize how interesting, or, you know, because they're just playing roles. Exactly. They're just yep. people. Mm -hmm. And there's so much thought that goes into playing another person. It's really interesting to hear who the person is and who the role is mm -hmm. and how how they grapple with that. And it's just so interesting. Yes. I also loved um, Dak Shepard. was <sighs> fascinating. Yes. Like, I didn't know anything about him. Yeah, yeah. But Hearing somebody talk about dealing with a uh, celebrity mm -hmm. and rehab yep. and marriage and like so interesting. So much. And it's Kristen, just, Kristen Bell. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. She was great too. Yeah. Yeah. And just the weirdest observations like her agent point or somebody pointed out that no matter how bad her character is, she has this likable thing about her mm -hmm. that could either work for her or against her. And you just need to learn how to harness who you already are. So interesting. Yep. It's so good. And I like what you said about it, it just makes these people reminds us that they're just real people you know real people live in lives and that's their job their job is to act like somebody else yeah and i'm surprised i love it so much because again like not a big hollywood person but it's it's a i think every field is really interesting when you dig into it and he just happens to be in the hollywood field sam jones and he's a great interviewer great at drawing things out of people he is and it's a lot about just their creativity and their journey in life you know and so some of it does come to talk about their roles and their movies and how they started in their jobs but i, I really like it as well because he kind of digs down a little bit deeper uh to their heart and soul about it okay so i love yeah. sam jones as well what else pantsuit politics which well, i don't is know this Okay, well, it's about politics. It's two women. Uh, one, There's Sarah from the left and Beth from the right. Okay, Jamie, I think you would like it, and here's why. You know how you were talking about space at the table uh -huh. and how it was, how they had a lot more nuance than mm -hmm. the typical conversation that yes. unfolds around a controversial yes. issue? So Pantsuit Politics, their tagline is something like crazy moderate, and they always focus on providing, and these are their words, not mine, like plenty of nuance to okay. any any political discussion. And I've always loved the presidential election cycles since mm -hmm. I was a kid. I just think it's so fascinating to see like how the pool of contenders narrows and how mm -hmm. like the key themes emerge. Like I love that possibility and potential thing. And then to see how like reality comes out of it. And this year it wasn't as fun to watch. So I've really appreciated a political podcast that is having deliberately nuanced and entertaining discussions to, um, Help me stay. Okay. <laughs> Help me I'm going to give it a chance. Really healthy. Give it a chance. It's a lot of fun. I'll give any podcast a chance. That's the Which truth. I'm talking about a political podcast and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And I wouldn't have expected those things. To right. 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 Okay. What's one more? Okay. Last one. West Wing Weekly. Will and I finally started watching <laughs> the West Wing this year. Uh-huh. And because, you know, everybody kept just telling us to watch it. Yes. And I turned my book in and we needed a show. And so we started and we got hooked and everybody said, hold on. You can't watch the West Wing without watching the West Wing Weekly, which is one of the, um, is Josh Molina who started in season four. Like now we're finally far enough in the West Wing that I've met this character. Okay. Who does the podcast, and um, Rishi from Sonic, Song Exploder. And they break down episode by episode. And it's just, it's another peek behind the scenes. And it's oh. so... Interesting. I think and at every first, show thought, should do that, right? Right, because we all are spending all this time watching TV, <laughs> yeah, so we need right. Our, we need to double our um, consumption. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I thought, like, we don't have time to watch The West Wing. Why would I listen to a week by week podcast? And they said, just try it, just try it. So I did, and we're hooked. Okay, that's um, awesome. My, my husband and I were in doing a very uncomfortable long car ride with the kids um, a couple months ago. And just about when I thought we were going to all lose our collective minds in the middle of Ohio, we turned on You've Got Mail for the Kids. And I, I cared enough that I streamed with my data, the West Wing Weekly. I think I paid $15. That's, I all, that's an investment. Episode. But like Will and I were like, oh, this is actually interesting. So we turned it up in the front. The kids are watching movie in the back. And we I think we listened to like five episodes, which is why I owed Verizon 15 bucks. But, <laughs> but if that, that was high praise. That it is was, awesome. It, it carried us through a trying time. Uh, Aaron Watt, my husband Aaron watched The West Wing years ago. Um, and I have tried several times. And it's almost like these shows are not related at all. So when I compare them, it's not because they're related. I just can't get into that or Gilmore Girls. And everyone talks about them. And I just, I've tried. And I just can't. So I, I don't you know. You know what that means though? What? That means you have like 250 hours of your life you can do something else there with. There you go. So I think yeah. So I just made a good choice, right? <laughs> you made a fine choice. Oh, uh, okay. Fine choice. Okay, I'm going to tell I like you. The, oh, you know, 
Yes. It, it doesn't mean your life isn't going to be as rich or full without these two TV shows in your life. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, okay. So here are some podcasts and I'm like you, like, I mean, not like you, but I will give any podcast a chance. So if someone, someone tells me about a podcast, I'm going to download it and I'm going to listen to some episodes and I kind of go in seasons as well, where I will listen to a lot of one show and then come back. Um, but so some shows that I'm liking right now at this moment, um, radio lab has a show that they put out this summer, I believe. And I don't think that they've had I mean, I haven't seen any come out in a while unless I'm missing something is called More Perfect. Did you listen to that? No, I don't know that one. You know, I'm looking at my feed and I don't see anything since July 15th. And so I don't know if it was just a small little series that they put out, but it's by Radio Lab and it's called More Perfect. And basically they go in and look at Supreme Court tri- trials. Oh, interesting. Super interesting. Super interesting. And so I loved it. And in fact... I mean, I only see like six episodes. So unless I'm missing something, that's all I've seen. So you're looking at, you know, committing five and a half hours or something. Uh, but I really, really liked it. And again, I'm not much into um, politics either, but they just went inside of these trials that you probably haven't even heard of and kind of dissected them. And it was so, so interesting. Loved it. Um, so there's that one. And then another one that I'm loving right now. And I don't know if you listen to this or not. Smartest person in the room. Yes, I haven't listened to religion, but I loved Hollywood. So um, Hollywood, it's I I didn't listen to all of them just because I was like, I'll save these for later. You know, it didn't like spark an interest in me right away. But the religion I have loved. In fact, I um, sent them a message the other day and just said, you guys are doing a great job with this. Um, asking very like great questions. The questions that I was thinking of asking this person as I'm listening, Laura said it. And I was like, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I am really, really enjoying it. Um, it just, she has this, it's giving a perspective from other people that are not like me that I'm super enjoying. So smartest person in the room. Do you know what she's going to do next? I don't know. I don't either. I don't know if she said. So she did Hollywood and then this is religion. And then I think she's going to keep going. Maybe we should I recommend so. what she should do next. Smartest person in the room about, I don't even know. We can put in our official nomination. We can put in our official nomination. Um, well, if you haven't listened to episode, I think it's episode two. It's the one with, I think his name is Ethan. He's a Hollywood set designer. Oh, I the didn't most see that one. Fascinating profession that I didn't know would be fascinating. Well, it's the kind of thing where, you know, like you were saying, like if you only listen to the people you know or the things that sound interesting, you miss out on a yeah. lot. I'm like, it's episode two. I'm just going to hit play. And I really like Laura. I knew it would be I well did, done. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, so fascinating. Like, if you only listen to it to hear his story about meeting Madonna, then I mean, it's worth life it. Lessons, you just don't know. Yeah. I listened to the bodyguard one. Did you listen to that one? I did. That was interesting as well. Yeah. Who knew? I know, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Then another show that I listened to this past year, it was called In the Dark. Um, I don't know that one. And it was put out by APM. I don't even understand who that is really. But so it was put out by In the Dark. And I listened to the first one because it kind of reminded me of um, what's the show that everyone started listening to podcasts about about three years ago. Um, you know, we all serial. Um, it took one crime and kind of dissected it over the weeks. So that's kind of what it was about. It was about mm-hmm. um, a crime that happened 27 years ago when a young boy was kidnapped and murdered. So at first when I was listening, I was like, I can do this. It's like watching 2020. It's a crime story. Like, I got this, right? And um, there was one episode where they're interviewing um, someone. And I, I I literally had to turn it off and stop for a minute because it was just a little too much about a kid. Um, but I, I kind of like got through that and kept going. And it was just, in- it was very interesting to see about this crime that happened so long ago. And of course, you know. 20 looking back everything's 2020 you can see everything that you should have done didn't do all that kind of things and so on one hand it's kind of hard to listen to them say what the police force should have done 20 years ago uh, almost 30 years ago but it was very interesting to see how things kind of played out in that um, investigation and those things are interesting to me so i really liked that whole series and it is over and done so it was good i liked it if you like kind of mystery things like that so yeah, okay, make a notes. Yeah, those are the three that um, I liked. Um, so that's what I got going on for podcasting. Super fun. Um, Super fun. Oh, okay, so I want to hear, what are three things you're loving these days besides podcast and reading? Oh, do you need more? That could fill up all your life right there. <laughs> right. Okay, so I have gotten super nerdy into pens and pencils. Oh. 
I find after wanting one for years in a very, yeah, nerd lust kind of way, I finally got a really cheap fountain pen. Um, when, cause we were in New York and we were at a store that sold them cause I knew I wanted one, but I didn't want to order online because I just had no clue. Mm-hmm. It would be like ordering jeans in a measurement system. You just weren't familiar with exactly like I knew nothing. So I got to play with them in person. And first I took one to the counter. She's like, Oh, this is a very nice choice. I'm like, Oh, is it? I thought it worked well. And I found out it was like $200. I'm like, oh, wow. Gosh. <laughs> I thought this had said less than that. Um, so I got a cheaper, much cheaper fountain pen, Right. but I love playing around with that. And then I discovered black wing pencils and I've been, um, totally nerding out with my writing utensils. Okay. What are black wing pencils? Cause I'm a pencil writer. Like I love writing in pencil. Okay, so there's a really technical description about how the wood is made out of blah, 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 Uh and the graphite is different and softer and you have more control and it writes better and it feels more like writing with a pen. I don't understand the technical stuff. You just know you like it. They're pretty and it feels a little different when you write. And I have been typing too much and I'm starting to feel it in my wrists because I play tennis when I was a kid and I like ruined both my wrists for all eternity, Uh which means I don't have to cut the grass. But (laughs) if you... Is the lawnmower like pushing something that's vibrating? But your really typing not is um, hurting, and that's your but, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been handwriting more, and it just, you know, like if you spend a lot of time writing, I'm totally cool with spending a little extra money for a tool that I'll be holding my hand for yeah. five hours a day. And I've just really been enjoying playing around with a different kind of writing instrument. Okay, I love that. Okay, what's another thing you're loving? Um, Trader Joe's Hot and Sweet Jalapenos. Ooh. So these are new this year. And they come in a little jar that's two forty nine, and we're going through them at an alarming <laughs> rate at my house because our meal planning strategy of late has been like, I don't know, what goes with hot and sweet jalapenos? That's so hilarious. And I your mean, kids like them? It. One kid likes them. Okay, okay. But that's, but, that's enough. See, I think we're making inroads because they're more sweet than hot. Yeah. Where you really can. I mean, they're not so... We don't live in Austin. Right. We're not like <laughs> Texas heat proven. Right, but right. But they're not, I mean, they'd probably be like candy yeah. in Texas. But yeah, we would just eat them like by the handful. Exactly. They're more sweet than hot and I can't eat them plain. Okay. So that does like slow you down a little bit. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm giving them to people for Christmas because I'm like evangelizing. They'll be like, oh, I love spicy foods. And I'll say, have you tried the hot and sweet jalapenos? There's this from Trader so Joe's. It's awkward to bring home like 30 jars of something from the grocery <laughs> store. So every time I go, I just get another couple of jars and put them in the put them in the cart. That is hilarious. I recently read a story about um, a man who is buying thousands of dollars of Trader Joe um, product and then setting up his own store in Canada because they do not have Trader Joe's. There's a reply all episode about this. Is that where I heard? Is that where I saw it? Maybe. Okay. I don't think I've listened to it yet. Okay. That is hilarious. I must have just read the description today because I was like, I know I just read this. That is so funny. Because I think I listened to it when there was snow on the ground. So now that would have been dying to last see it. year. Oh, it's old. It's old. And I just I mean, read, that's super old. Yeah, but still. But six months plus. And I must have just seen it. Okay, interesting. You were just waiting till the time was right. I was waiting till the time was right. But isn't that funny about his little Trader Joe experience? Yes, that so was So you funny. listened to it. Did he actually set up a store? Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. A trade, the, uh, it was not one of the better Reply All episodes uh, okay. I listened to. Okay. I'm sorry to say. That's okay. But... Yeah. yeah. Um, imagine like that you opened a grocery store and you need to get your stock from somewhere and he got his across the border. Wait, was this reply all or was this the one where they started the businesses? Oh, you know what I mean? Right. It's startup. It's startup. startup. And it wasn't one of the better episodes of startup. Okay. That's what, that's I, was, what, I, meant that's what I was thinking. The first season of startup I really liked. Me too. I, I can't remember even now what it was about, but I remember liking it. It's weird. It was about, it was about Gimlet. Oh yeah. When they started the whole thing. Hello. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's the third thing you're loving? Um, right now I am really loving my city. So that's Louisville, Kentucky. And if you don't live in Louisville, like that's okay. It's Uh not going to, you know, ruin, ruin your opportunity to try this favorite because, um, what I have in mind picking, well, first of all, like my husband and I have had a great like month or two in the city. Like Ivory Glass was in town this past weekend Uh and we saw Olsen Whitehead the other night because Louisville has a lot of like arts, culture, literary Mm -hmm. stuff going on for a second tier airport city. And um, we've tried lots of great new restaurants with the kids and it's a great season to be out. And um, well, what I mean is it's a beautiful sunny day. It could be 17 degrees tomorrow, but it's just a really nice time of year to be out in the parks and it's easy access to everything. Unlike say Chicago, where we used to live. Um, 
So I really like it here. But I think something that has helped me really like it here that is widely applicable is this. I see, Jamie, I'm totally double dipping. Um, I read a book this fall by Melody Warnick. It's called This Is Where You Belong. And the subtitle is something like The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live. Mm -hmm. So she takes a look at people who love where they live. And some are totally predictable. Like she used to live in Austin. People love Austin. Right. Maybe not the prices, but people love Austin. And Portland. But she also looks at people who love places that you and I would be like, I am never moving there in a million years because who could enjoy living there? But she looks at the characteristics of why people love where they live. And some of it is um, on the cities, like the city or small town or, you know, rural driveway has to own it. Like the city has to offer certain things for people to love it. But then the other half is meeting it halfway where she says, if you get involved in whatever is already happening, or if you make something happen, you're going to enjoy loving where you live right. more. And that is within your control. So I've really been thinking about that this fall as we consider like how to participate in the communities we're involved in around here and whether to buy tickets for Colson Whitehead or the orchestra or you know whatever, or whether, you know, just taking a walk through the park. Like, yeah. oh, this is a lovely place, except there's that piece of trash and I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> right. Those kind of things. Yeah. So yeah, I'm loving my city and that book and the little perspective shift it gave I me. I love that. I love my city, Austin. We've loved it since we moved here. We love it a well, lot. Well, she talks about it in that book. I'd be curious to hear what you think about her take on it. Ooh, I would love it. to hear that. Yeah. And I'm looking at it. I wonder when she wrote it. It just came out this... Um, Published in 2016. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. So can, is that going to be what you're reading or what are you currently reading right now? <laughs> or how many books are you yeah. currently reading? Um, like four. Do you um, read four at a time or do you read one, finish, read another one, read another one? I do read multiple books at a time. Okay. Um, and sometimes there's like seven and sometimes there's just two. Yeah. And usually I have an audio book going, but I just finished that really bad memoir. So now I have to decide <laughs> what to start next. It might be The Winds of War because somebody was just raving about that on my podcast and okay. I just picked it up. It's a whisper sync deal for cheap. So maybe that'll, except it's like 50 hours. So oh. I'm going to have to debate about that. Okay. I'm reading The News of the World by Paulette Giles. And I just started it last night. I'm on like page 20. Okay. And you're uh, going to keep going. I'm going to keep going because I already found out that, well, I've seen it on a couple best of the year lists, which doesn't really mean much because I've also seen books that I thoroughly hated on uh, best of the year lists. So you never can tell, but I already found out. So it's historical fiction and apparently there's a man who charges people money to read them the news of the world that he accumulates from various daily newspapers. Like he reads them all and then he tells the people what they need to know Okay. in this small town in, I think, Texas. Uh Uh-huh. So I'm like, okay, so we have books, reading, newspapers, an interesting title. Okay, I, I can hang on here. Okay. We, could, we, could, we can do something with this. Um, I'm reading Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides for the first time. Uh-huh. And that was inspired by a... Um, so I have been meaning to read this forever because I read The Marriage Plot by him when it came out like four or five years ago and I didn't love it. And everybody said, yeah, it was no Middlesex. You have got to read Middlesex. And he's also really well known for the Virgin Suicides, which I haven't read, but that's not as high on the priority list. But I read this book coming out in February that I just loved called This Is How It Always Is by Lori Frankel. And um, Middlesex seems like uh, it reminded me for reasons I won't go into. That Frankel book reminded me that I've been reading to read Middlesex forever. And uh-huh. I finally want to strike it off the list. Okay. And for the same reason, I'm reading The Sparrow, finally, for the first time. And I'm I'm not, I have like 15 more books by my bedside because I'm deciding which like contemporary, lighter, fair I'm going to dive into. I, I just need you to send me what to read every month because all these books that you're mentioning, I've never heard of any of them. Like a, like a coffee subscription exactly, for reading. Exactly, exactly. It's like it's meal planning. Exactly. It's, it's like prep dish, but for reading. Exactly. I think you're onto something, you know, like prep dish sends us our recipes and you need to send me my book list every month. You got um, it. That would be... 22 to 47 on Thursday. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm reading a book I've never read before that a lot of people have read as well. The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Have you I'm re- surprised you've never read that. I know. Have you read? I have. And you know, I didn't read it until um until I was an adult. Yeah. What are you what do you think about it? Well, I think this is I think that when I first started it, I was so confused. Um and I had to read like different pages twice. I mean, it was just like I was so confused of where it was coming from and then once I got a hold of 
who was talking and, and what was happening, then it was a little better. It's a very small book, but I just haven't picked it up in a while because I've been writing. I haven't been reading much. But yeah, so I like it. But it's it was hard at first. Does that make sense? Yeah, because he really messes with your perspective and point of view. Yes. Yeah. But I kept wanting to read. It. I wanted more. Um, and then I also just picked up the other day, which I'm probably not going to finish this until again I'm finished because I'm going to not read any more books until I'm finished writing. But Seth Haynes, his book Coming Clean. Have you yeah. read, have you read? I have. Okay. Um, I just picked it up. I literally read like the first like 25 pages and then I thought I got to put this down because I have work to do. So, but that's, those are the two that when I read, that's where I'll pick up again. I gotcha. I thought that was really well done. Yeah. Well, good. I'm excited about it. I, Amber was on the show and she was just a doll. And so I'm excited about diving into his stuff as well. So I gotcha. Yeah. I really liked the screw tape letters. So that made, um, I have a screw tape letters moment. I read that when I had a baby who wouldn't sleep Mm -hmm. and didn't sleep for like five years and I was losing my ever loving mind Uh and which is a theme that has come up on the happy hour before. (laughs) Yes. But I remember C.S. Lewis saying something in the book where, because you know, the whole guise is that it's told from the perspective of what a demon. Yes. Or some other scary word Uh training Uh a junior demon on how to thoroughly mess people over. Yes. Which that's why I was so confused, not confused, but it's like you have to shift in your brain. Who's talking here? Like, it just, it was weird. Okay, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, it's not, it's not typical. Right. Um, So he says that, like, to really undermine a human's effectiveness, you need to convince them that their time is totally their own and they get to decide what they want to do with it. And that was really freeing to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, even now today, like, I have too much to do. It's really good to remember that. Like, I'm only in control to a point yes. and that is okay. But yes. then when I was, when I was, um, zombie, like sleep deprived yeah. back then it was really, and I felt like I had zero control over my time. That was really good to be like, mm. you know what? That is maybe not the worst thing in the yes. world. I remember the part, I haven't gotten like as far into it as I would like to be, but I remember underlining a part recently where it talked about, um, convincing humans as well that um, pain and tragedy like will kind of take them out and ruin them. And because and then he said, because I can't remember how he talks about God, but he says that God can actually use those to make someone better. But we need to convince humans that they can't. Um, And I remember reading that thinking, oh, my gosh, this is like this was it was really good for me in that moment as well. So that's interesting that we both took out different things about it. What made you pick that up? Uh, a happy hour guest was talking about it as one of just her favorite books of all times. And I said, I've mm-hmm. never read it. And I said, oh, I'm going to read it before your show comes out because I had recorded her show probably about three months before it came out. Um, and sure enough, I mean, if you're like me, I record I record a lot of shows in a row um, and then I work on other stuff. And so her show came up to be uh, released and someone <laughs> sent me a message and was like, oh, have you read the book yet? And I was like, oh, crap. No, I haven't. And I told her I would, you know, and so I ordered it and picked it up. And so, yeah, I think it's a very small book, but I think it'll take me longer than normal to read this book. I don't know if it's something about me, but you just have to think a lot about it. Um, But I'm enjoying it. All that to say. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And thanks so much for coming on the happy hour. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was so fabulous. And enjoy your beautiful Louisville city. (laughs) <laughs> thanks and i think you just cursed me we're gonna have like four feet of snow the day this airs <laughs> oh my gosh we in austin cannot even imagine that like they even predict that there might be some um you know precipitation in the air and the whole like city shuts down in january and february it's kind of crazy but anyhow. i'll send you a space heater and some coffee <laughs> yes 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 exactly um okay have a great day thank you All you right. too i'll talk to you later bye okay bye Hey guys, wasn't that a great conversation with Anne? I now know that you have a lot more books and podcasts to add to your life this year. Hey, I also want to thank another one of the partners for this show, and that is their for Teen Gathering. You know what? High school girls all have fears, insecurities, and passions. If you're just out of high school, you remember it, or if you're 20 years removed like me, you definitely still remember it. Therefore, addresses these in a real, honest way through great speakers, interactive experiences, and powerful worship. It's a gathering for high school girls, inspiring the next generation of girls to boldly live out their identity in Christ. Right now, tickets are normally $59, but you can use the promo code Jamie Ivy and get tickets for 49 
This conference is right here in my state of Texas in Fort Worth, and it is February 17th through 18th with dynamic speakers including Annie Downs, Amina Brown, Kat Armstrong, and Winter Evans Pitts. I love all of those ladies and know that you will as well. So check them out to find out more. Conference is there for teen gathering. Guys, today's show is edited by Logan Garza and the music is from Jason Poe. Next week, my guest is Renee Swope and she is one of the contributors to a book coming out soon called Craving Connection. And don't we all want just that? You will love to hear from her about parenting a child with special needs, thoughts on finding our identity and things that we do, connecting with women, and her story of her son telling her that he had decided to be an atheist. Guys, I'm so excited to announce that our next Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey live event, which is at my house, will be held on Friday, March 10th and Saturday, March 11th. Tickets go on sale this coming Friday, January 20th, and you can pick either Friday or Saturday night. Each night, there will be two fabulous women joining me on the stage, and I want to let you know who those guests are going to be. We have Tara Lee Cobble, Melanie Dale, Jamie Nato, and Carrie Sowers. I love each of these ladies, and you have loved them on the show, and so I am so excited about getting them in my backyard for this event. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I'm giving away two tickets tomorrow morning, so head on over there and get in on that competition. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you should now. It's at Jamie Ivey. Guys, enjoy your week, share the show with a girlfriend, and have a happy hour with a friend.